as we head into the sixth seal, we left off with the fifth seal last week. The sixth seal is about the coming of Jesus. I want to look at a few verses that kind of encompass the plan of salvation. Is a well-known, all of these are well-known verses, but that we put them in the perspective of what we're looking at in the study of the seven seals. You know John 3.16 very well. God so loved the world. Not just Christians, not just some people, but everyone from every walk of life, from every religious system, from every part of the planet, for every generation. He so loved the world. The Father so loved that he gave us Jesus. That whosoever believes in him, which means you're willing to live under his authority as king of kings, that we would not perish but have eternal life. We're going to look, look at the end of this verse, at the perishing part of John 3.16 that is forgotten today. And we focus on love, but the perishing part is part of that love. God will deal with sinners in the most merciful way that he can. And we're going to look at that this morning because it's crucial that we understand that we are accountable to the Lord for how we live this life. God says in Ezekiel 33, as surely as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. And we know what that means. That turning is repent, that they would repent. So turn means repent, turn away from sin Turn toward me. Turn from your evil ways. He goes on to say, he addresses his people. Oh, Israel, why would you die? I've come to give you life. Why are you choosing death? In Matthew 24, Jesus speaks some very sobering words that you and I need to take to heart today. Applicable and relevant for us. Because of the increase of wickedness, we are seeing a massive increase of wickedness today. He said that is causing the love of most to grow cold. And not talking about the world, talking about the church. The love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Most of the church will grow cold. Are you hearing that? Most. And again, Jesus says, small is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. Only a few find it. You know why? Because only a few are looking for it. If we are looking for it, certainly the spirit will lead us to that small gate on the narrow road, and empowers to stay on the narrow road. The problem is the church is comfortable on the broad road. The church is comfortable on the broad road. And we need to be alert to the fact that at any given time, you and I can be distracted and get on the broad road. We are not exempt from going there because today we are being, being faithful to Jesus. Matthew 25 says that when the Son of Man comes in all his glory, with all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. The nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the sheep from the goats as, one, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. In order to understand what this verse is talking about, we need to have a larger understanding of what the Bible says, because when Jesus, it doesn't mean that when Jesus comes in that moment, he's going to give judgment in that moment. When Jesus comes in the clouds on his sitting on his glorious throne, judgment will already have taken place. That is what is happening today. That is why we're looking at the seals and what, what that means. The third seal is when judgment began, and the fourth seal is when the judgment of the living begins, so that by the time we reach the 1260 days of mercy, all decisions are made. 
and God has judged according to our choices. He judges us according to what we do. And at the end of the 1260 days, remember the tribulation is 1335 days. You find that in Daniel 12. By the time we reach the 1260 days of mercy, we get to that day, the door to salvation is closed. Just like God closed the door to the ark, so will the door to salvation be closed. We looked last week at the fact that the fifth seal is martyrdom, that God will push all those that are living, his people, to the front lines to use them to rescue any and all people that can be reached. He will proclaim, come out of her, my people, and he will use the 144,000 and any others that may be alive at that day that God decides to use as martyrs to win the last few souls. The 144,000 will be resurrected in the next, in, on the 1264th day, and then God will prepare to pour out the seven bowls of wrath. This happens prior to the sixth seal being uh, removed. And the last two bowls, the fifth bowl says to prepare the way for the kings of the east. The barriers are all removed. If you understand the, the river Euphrates and the language there, it tells us that all barriers are removed and the kings of the east, which are the father and the son, are coming to take their people home. The sixth seal is the coming of Jesus and it's also part of the seventh bowl. So let's take a look at the sixth seal, which emphasizes and declares the glory of Jesus. If you would like to look at Revelation chapter 6. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. In the sixth bowl, if you look at the sixth bowl, excuse me, the seventh bowl, uh, hail, 200 pounds, heavy, falls during this time, and there is great panic. And the, the wicked say, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. Now take note of this, because I've been trying to lay a foundation of things in case you don't understand what tritheism is, this is a, another wonderful example and a pillar in the ground for understanding two separate gods here. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Two. For great is the day of their wrath. Great is the day. Who can withstand it? So the scene here is that Jesus and the Father, the kings of the east, come. The Holy Spirit's there invisible, can't see him. A representation of the Father. We won't see the Father's face, but we'll see a glorious being, a form of a glorious being, sort of like what Daniel saw when he said the ancient of days, what, when he saw the ancient of days. Um, also, remember in Matthew 26, 64, Jesus told the Jews, in the future, you will see me coming in the clouds of glory, sitting at the right hand of the mighty one. Remember that it enraged the Jews at that time because Jesus was claiming to be equal to the Father, not just that, but a separate being. And their worst nightmare will appear because Jesus says in the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 verse 7, that all who pierced him will be resurrected to see him coming in the clouds. Every one that was involved, the Pharisees, the high priest, the soldiers, all who had any part in the death, in the torture, 
and in the and the crucifixion of Christ will be resurrected the Bible says yes even those who pierced him will see him coming in the clouds the father has decreed it so Remember seal one, the Holy Spirit sets off on a mission to take salvation by faith out into the world, and he has um, a reward for those that are willing to live by faith, a winner's bow and a crown. Well, that's completed in seal six when Jesus says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to give to each person according to what they have done. We are judged according to our choices. Did we live by faith? Did we love God and love others or not? What God will be looking at. And so that mission is completed at the sixth seal when Jesus rescues his people and he is able to take them home. Now, I want for us to be clear on how this happens. Let's talk a little bit about there's so much going on when Jesus comes in the clouds. Too many details for me to have in this in this study, in this message. But I want to make sure that we understand a few basic things from 1 Thessalonians 4. By the word of the Lord, we declare to you that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, you know, they were hoping it was in their day. They believed it was in their day. Will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. When people die, they sleep in the ground. They're not in heaven or in hell. They are sleeping. The Bible teaches this from Genesis to Revelation. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So when Jesus appears, the wicked are all in an uproar. You remember that Satan has has sent three powerful demons out to rally the kings of the earth, and they are going to try to destroy Jesus as he comes to rescue his people. God, with his word, puts them to sleep and is raising the dead at the same time. So the wicked will see the redeemed coming out of their graves, and they will be powerless to do anything about it. Then the wicked will be put to sleep. But those that are dead go first. And then Paul says, we who are left here, we who are alive, join up with them. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? To meet the Lord in the air. Jesus never sets foot on this planet. Another great deception of the enemy that the prophecies of the Old Testament that applied only to Israel, if they had been faithful and had accepted Messiah, that would have been the time where Jesus would have reigned on the earth because Israel rejected Messiah. The plan changed. And so Jesus is no longer going to reign on this planet. So we are going to meet him in the air and be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What great encouragement to know that God has a plan to rescue us. So the millennium millennium then will start as Jesus rescues his people on a Sunday because first fruits are always presented on a Sunday. The millennium will begin. The earth will rest for 1,000 years. We will go to heaven and reign with Christ. Now, this 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ is with his saints in heaven. This is at the first resurrection before the second resurrection. Between the first and second, there is 1,000 years. We're going to open up Revelation 20 this morning, if you'll go there. And we're going to read some of this so that we can understand and get the big picture of how God wraps up the sin problem and why we can have total confidence in God, in his plan, in who he is. My entire motivation for studying this and for presenting it is to have us look again at how 
faithful God is and how confident we can be in him. His plan is perfect. And it is up to us to continue to look at his plan and to see details in the plan maybe that we've never seen before. Because God's word is always fresh off the page when we read it. Always. If we are looking, then we will find new treasure. I'd like to start in verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on his forehead or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now take note of the next little parentheses that John writes there. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years ended. Blessed and holy are those who have a part in the first resurrection. That is the resurrection that we are looking forward to. The second death has no power over them, for they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. I want to look at this, these thrones that are set in place for the redeemed. And do you remember Paul's words? Do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? What does that mean? Do we decide whether someone gets life or death? Absolutely not. That's God's job. We are not God. So what does it mean that we judge? We're like a jury giving out a sentence for what is owed for the violence and the atrocities that the wicked have to pay. You and I are, will be inside the city with the Lord, and so we have our debt completely paid by Jesus, which is an incredible thing to behold. But either Jesus pays the price for us, or we pay the price for ourselves. Obadiah one fifteen says, for your sins will come back on your own head. Either Jesus pays for your sins, or I pay for my own sin and restitution, make, making things right. In God's economy, there's not just if I steal $5, I don't just pay the $5, but I pay interest on those $5. And sometimes in God's economy, it's 400 times what was, what was owed. So God expects for every debt to be paid. An eye for an eye, a hand for a hand. A foot for a foot, a life for a life. Someone that stole $20 and someone who killed someone do not have the same restitution to make. And God is all about each one of us paying what we owe. And so the redeemed will be the jury to give the time that will be spent in the lake of fire, which is the only thing that the wicked will have is their flesh to pay with. And so the wicked will be put into the lake of fire and they will be sustained by God to pay in suffering and agony in the lake of fire for what they owe. It's it's an incredible system that God has. He has a way to rescue all of those that want to be rescued. And if we choose to defy and rebel then there's nothing else that God can do for us but basically to put us out of our misery because that's what wickedness is. Wickedness turns and sin turns people into predators. And predators prey on others and become self-consumed. You and I will become predators unless we allow the Holy Spirit to do his work in us. I mean, it's, we either become like Jesus or we become like Satan. And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things in this life? So in the judging, it will be the jury. 
that decides what the sentence is for each person. That's going to take a long time because the majority of people are in the ground. The majority of people don't get resurrected in the first resurrection because most of the people on earth will be lost. The majority of the people on planet earth from Adam to the last person that is born, the majority will be lost. One third will be saved. Find that in the book of Zechariah. And so it's important that we understand that God has a plan to save anyone who is willing to be saved. Anyone who wants to be saved. If we are willing to turn from the ways of the flesh, he will empower us. He will give us the power to be overcomers of our flesh. We can't do it on our own. But through his power, his grace is always sufficient. Every single day. And the redeemed will be victorious because of Christ. And so when we get to heaven, we will just be a puddle of tears, I'm sure. I see myself being, being in a puddle of tears for quite a few years. So we have a thousand years to get comfortable in our, wow, in our new surroundings, in the presence of the Lord, being with the angels, being reunited with loved ones, catching up with all the people that we've known through our lives and just glorying and worshiping God. And then eventually we will all, sit down and be a part of a huge courtroom and God will give us the right to pass sentence on every wicked person and angel that defied his authority. We can say we love God, but it can only be words. And God's not looking for words. He says, if you love me, tell me every day. I don't think that's in scripture. If you love me, keep my commandments. We can tell God that we love him. But what are we backing it up with? Is there fruit to our words? God is looking for fruit. And to have fruit, the fruit is of the spirit. We must be walking with the spirit. And what God is always doing every single day to produce fruit is he is getting rid of the pride and arrogance in our lives on an ongoing basis. We are prideful creatures. We are know-it-all creatures. That's arrogance. And that has to go in order that the humility of Christ, a characteristic that totally undoes me when I think about the season that we're in, looking at the humility of Almighty Creator becoming a helpless baby for the purpose of redeeming us, for the purpose of becoming the Lamb of God. The ent- his entire purpose was that, suffering for us, loving us so extravagantly, giving everything for us. It's an incredible thing. So the sixth seal reveals the glory of Jesus Christ. The seventh seal reveals the deity of Jesus. And this is utterly amazing how the sin problem is totally wrapped up after the thousand years. Um, Let's look at, just jump down to verse 11. In chapter 20, then I saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. If you've never looked at this before, take note that John sees the dead, great and small, everyone is standing in this place. After the thousand years, 
God will resurrect all of the wicked. For one time, for one little space of time in earth's history, every angel and human being that has ever had God's breath in them will be alive at the same time. Wow, what an incredible thing. The saints will be in the new Jerusalem, which will come down and hover over the earth, safe in God's protection. God will raise all of the wicked, and everyone will be present when he opens the seventh seal. The Bible says only this about it. He opened the seventh seal, and there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I believe that during this time, from all of the evidence that the Bible gives, we have books that are opened. You and I each have a book where God has recorded all of our choices and the story of our life. And then there is another book. Look at the rest of the, of the passage. Another book. Books were open. There's a pile of books. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the book of life? No. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. This goes perfectly with so many other passages in Scripture that we are judged by what we do. Jesus said, my reward is with me to give to each one according to what he has done. Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes 12 tells us that God will, there's nothing hidden in his sight. He sees every, every single action and every word, and he reads every thought. The dead were judged according to what they had done. God will show every person their life somehow in that 30 minutes, the wicked will know why they are not in the city. We serve a God that is so good and so kind and so faithful and so transparent and so majestic and so glorious that he's not just going to wipe out these wicked people that he gave life to, that he loves, he, he is going to tell them why he must destroy them. He will reveal to each one from their own life how he tried every way possible to save every being and how they refused his offer of salvation. Remember, they refused to love the truth. They refused to love the Lord. They refused to do what was right. God God accepts men from all nations who fear him and do what is right. They refuse to do what is right. Doing what is right means the ways of righteousness. God's ways of righteousness, that is doing what is right, not what is right in my eyes, what is right according to what God says is right. And so there was nothing else that God could do to save any of them. And so he says this is why each one. And individually, I love this picture because God is a one-on-one God. He loves every single person. Billions and billions and billions of wicked people that are standing there. He will speak through the power of the Holy Spirit. He will speak to each one about their life. Because every life is valuable to God. Even before he destroys them, every life will know, I loved you. I came knocking again and again. Look at all the times that I tried to save you. Look at how you defied my authority over and over again. 
Love doesn't force. I couldn't force you to love me. I couldn't force you to do what is right. So I had to let you go to do your own way and to do your own thing. Every one of them will know. Jesus, it will be revealed as he speaks that he is equal to the Father, that he and the Father are like twins. And actually, some place along the way, we'll have to have the, the unveiling and the revelation of the Holy Spirit because actually there's tritheism is three equal gods. In this scenario, because Jesus is the one speaking, the Father will pronounce and it will be seen that Jesus is Almighty God equal in every way to the Father. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. This is when this takes place. Every knee will bow. The wicked will bow out of fear for what is coming. The redeemed will bow out of gratitude, knowing that the only reason they are in heaven is because of what Jesus has done for them. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every single person that is alive is going to bow and every tongue acknowledge, get that word, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can you say amen to that this morning? How beautiful is that? It is incredible. Absolutely incredible. This is why our God is trustworthy. We can have complete confidence in him. We can know that he is working all things for our good, that if we are willing to live under his authority, if we are willing to go and be and do as he asks, he will empower us to do so. Whatever he asks us to do, he empowers us to do it. If we are dealing with difficult circumstances today, if our heart is broken, if we're suffering due to health problems, your Lord will enable you to get through it. It is who he is. This world is not perfection. We're going to perfection. This world is filled with trouble. In the church, there's trouble. And you and I will only make it through if we put our complete trust in Jesus Christ. If we have total confidence in his plan. If we are willing to be obedient, even when we don't understand. I don't understand why I'm going through this, Lord, but I know that you have me. I am yours. You will protect me. You will get me through this. And when I mean by protection, I don't mean that God's going to keep us from stubbing our toe. That's not realistic. I mean that he will protect our faith. He will help us to stay faithful. He will keep us from totally giving up. And I know we've all felt like giving up at times when there's been betrayal, when there has been hurt, when there has been trouble, when we have had things come from left field and we, we don't know why things are going on or why things are happening. Yes, but we are not people of the world. We are people of Jesus Christ. We are his people. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. We trust him, and we must have non-negotiable faith, non-negotiable faith in our God. Once God tells the wicked why they could not be saved, he reveals the choices, then the lake of fire would be ignited, and God will put every wicked person in to the lake of fire to extract restitution. Each person will pay. And I want you to understand that this lake of fire, this sea of fire, only exists for the purpose of extracting restitution. Once the last person is burned up, which we know is Satan, then the lake of fire will be extinguished and done away with as well. 
Uh, Malachi says it very clearly. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day is coming, it will set them on fire, says the Lord God Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord God Almighty. The wicked will be reduced to ashes and gone. And when that happens, yay, best part of the story. I have to read it because we, we can't close on that. That's sad. Sad way to close message, even though it's very relevant for us to understand today. Let's look at, you're already there, chapter 21. Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. You're good Bible students. That sea also means lake. What is it referring to? The lake of fire. There is no more lake of fire. It's gone. It's with the old order of sin. It's gone. Now there's new heaven, new earth. They're going to be remade because they were corrupted and polluted by sin. Now God has changed his people. We are perfect with the righteousness of Christ, which is hard to imagine, I know, but by faith we believe it. And... The earth will be made new. Ah, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. What an awesome thing for us to look forward to. And beyond that, one thing that I want to leave us with as as we close up this study is that once it's all completed, Jesus then gives back the scepter of power to the Father. One God sits on the throne. Remember we talked about the scepter of power being passed from the Father to Jesus when he took the book of life. If you, if you weren't here for that, please go back and look at that. It's an incredible study. Jesus gives back the scepter of power to the Father so that he can dwell among his creation because that is what the creator does. He is going to walk and be with us. And, ah, Can you not have total confidence in a God family that is so incredibly loving, patient, kind, faithful, long-suffering, extravagantly loving to us? I, I hope that this look at the seven seals and the incredible revelation of the missions of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus revealing who he is a little bit at a time. I hope it fills your hearts with great joy at a time where there is so much uncertainty in our world. There's so much craziness. Just this year alone has brought so much craziness to this planet. And... We can know without a doubt that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We need not fear. We must be faithful people. We must have non-negotiable faith. No matter what we find ourselves in the midst of, we know that this world is not our home, that bad things happen to good people on a sinful planet, but that God is going to right everything one day And that you and I are going to be repaid a hundred times over for anything that we've had to sacrifice for his name. We don't deserve that. We deserve death and we're treated like royalty. 
because we belong to the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you contemplate the birth of the king, as you contemplate the humility that they demonstrate, may you be filled with joy. May you be filled with the peace that passeth all understanding. And may your life stand firmly on the rock of Jesus Christ. Because, friends, he is coming soon. Stay awake. Be alert. Get in the word. Know his plan. And more than anything, know that you know that you know that he loves you.